Welcome to Two Messianic Jews, where we think deeply about Messianic Jewish history and theology. Today we have part two of a significant conversation that took place last November at the world's largest biblical studies conference between two traditional Jewish scholars, Dr. Kenneth Hansen and Dr. Zev Garber, and two Messianic Jewish scholars, Dr. David Rudolph and Dr. Mark Kinzer. Part one, which is linked in the description, was asking, does the New Testament portray Jesus as God with Dr. Hansen and Dr. Rudolph? This is part two with Dr. Garber and Dr. Kinzer asking, can a divine Messiah fit within Judaism? As mentioned in part one, this event was conducted after the publication of Judaism and Jesus, a book co-written by Dr. Hansen and Dr. Garber, which is a series of essays studying the historical Jesus and asking whether Messianic Jews should be welcomed into the wider Jewish community. This is the first book written by traditional Jews inviting Messianic Jews into a good faith conversation. The conversation you'll be listening to right now is the fruit of that invitation. Like in part one, these are scholars speaking at an academic conference, and so they do use some complex language and make some complex arguments. Listen closely and you will learn a lot. Not only that, but these scholars do a great job of demonstrating how we can have meaningful and impassioned discussion on the most crucial of topics, even with those we strongly disagree with. If this topic piques your interest, please consider subscribing to the channel and the podcast to get notifications so you do not miss any videos on this topic and others like it. And with that, without further ado, here is Dr. Mark Kinzer. I am uh, Mark Kinzer, uh, President Emeritus of uh, Messianic Jewish Theological Institute. The 21st century has seen no shortage of books dealing with the historical Jesus in Judaism. Zeb Garber and Kenneth Hansen's recent addition to this expanding library is distinguished from the rest by one feature that is highlighted by the present panel. Though the authors identify as Orthodox Jews, they take seriously the work of Messianic Jews, such as David Rudolph and myself, and value our contribution to the discussion of Judaism and Jesus in the 21st century. Nevertheless, their respect for our unique perspective on Jesus does not imply acceptance of our Jewish legitimacy. In fact, Garber and Hansen unequivocally denied that legitimacy, at least for Messianic Jews who affirm Jesus' dual divine human identity. Chapter six of the book is devoted to this denial. The chapter is written by Hansen, but echoes themes stated by Garber elsewhere in the volume. Hansen here interacts repeatedly with my writings. While respecting my scholarship, he deems my efforts futile. From his perspective, any attempt to elaborate a Jewish affirmation of Jesus' divinity amounts to a contradiction in terms. I will not here defend the writings which Hansen cites. Instead, I will examine the single proposition underlying his critique and contend that this proposition is unsupported by texts central to the Jewish tradition itself. Here is the proposition in question. Quote, however Kinzer and others may try to finesse the point, the incarnation has always been and will always remain incompatible with the traditional Jewish understanding of the oneness of God encapsulated in the Shema, end of quote. As seen here, Hansen's case rests on an interpretation of the divine echad confessed in the Shema, an interpretation alleged to be universal among faithful Jews throughout history. The same point is reiterated by Garber, who on three occasions uses the phrase absolute monotheism as shorthand for an understanding of the Shema which excludes divine differentiation as and incarnation. In a move common to 19th and 20th century Judaism, Garber and Hansen interpret the Shema in Maimonidean terms as an ontological statement 
concerning divine simplicity and transcendence. As Hansen states, quote, the otherness of Israel's de deity became the very essence of ethical monotheism, end of quote. From this perspective, denying that the Logos was incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth is not an a posteriori historical judgment, but an a priori metaphysical assumption. As Louis Jacobs argued in the last century, quote, Jews have held that God being God cannot assume human flesh, end of quote. The God of Israel is by definition disembodied. This picture of an absolute monotheism held universally by faithful Jews through the centuries might have been credible to inform Jewish readers a century ago. A brief summary of relevant Jewish scholarship of the past two or three decades, however, shows that it is no longer so. To begin with Jewish biblical studies. In the bodies of God and the world of ancient Israel, Benjamin Sommer demolishes the Maimonidian reading of the Pentateuch, arguing that all streams of the biblical tra tra tradition concur in the belief that Israel's God has a body. The source traditions disagree only on where that body is located and whether it is fixed in a singular location heaven for Deuteronomy, the tabernacle temple for the priestly writings, or fluidly present in various places at the same time, as in J and E traditions. Sommer concludes the volume by pointing to Christian theology and Jewish mysticism as natural extensions of this biblical view of God. Daniel Boyarin and Moshe Idel carry the counter Maimonidian narrative forward in their studies of Second Temple Judaism, undercutting any interpretation of the period which marginalizes Binitarian Logos theology. Such perspectives, such as Binitarian Logos theology, were not external Greek or Gnostic accretions distorting the pure absolute monotheism of the Bible, but played an important role in multiple streams of Second Temple Judaism, including the proto-rabbinic movement itself. Alon Goshen Gottstein and Jacob Neusner continue the story by describing the embodied deity of the rabbinic tradition. In the words of the former, quote, one of the central issues that sets rabbinic theology apart from later medieval developments is the attribution of body or form to the Godhead, end of quote. On the other hand, the emerging rabbinic establishment did attempt to suppress views of divine differentiation, such as the Binitarianism common in the Second Temple period. As Boyarin and Idel note, it is all the more remarkable that such suppressed currents reemerged in the Jewish mystical tradition, a phenomenon which Idel calls the great bypass. This reemergence is evident in the Hechelot literature with its depiction of Metatron as the name bearing angel of Exodus 23 who is referred to as the little yud heh vav -Hey, and also with its exotic shior koma texts, which detail the measurements of the divine body. The latter tradition, shior koma, may even have left its mark on the Alenu prayer found in the Rosh Hashanah and daily Jewish liturgy. Idel, Boyarin, and Joseph Dan all suggest that this prayer is originally binitarian, addressing both the master of all, Adon HaKol, and the creator of the beginning, Yotzer Breshit. Idel's great bypass 
reaches its canonical destination in medieval Kabbalah. The Kabbalistic distinction between Ein Sof and the Sefirot undermines any assertion that the Maimonidian doctrine of divine simplicity functioned as a normative Jewish conviction before the modern era. David Novak has even argued that widespread Jewish acceptance of the Kabbalistic vision of a differentiated deity led medieval Jewish authorities to alter their halachic assessment of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. In contrast to the Maimonidian view of divine transcendence, Elliot Wolfson highlights the incarnational impulse operative in Kabbalistic tradition. He shows how Kabbalah treats the sefirot as equivalent to the divine body on the one hand and the divine name and heavenly Torah on the other. God's body is a text, a heavenly text, and is perceived through an informed study of its earthly inscription and activated through observance of the commandments contained therein. The mitzvot of the Torah enable Israel to become an agent of divine enfleshment. The Kabbalistic tradition took on new form in the 18th century Hasidic movement, which has carried it into our own century. Shaul Magid has studied the incarnational thrust of that movement, demonstrating both its divergence from Maimonidian theism and its many similarities to Christian thought. He argues that Hasidic incarnationalism developed as a natural expression of Kabbalah in an insular Jewish setting unaffected by the presence of Christian onlookers. Elliot Wolfson, in turn, focuses upon the theology of Chabad Hasidism. He shows how the pan-entheistic orientation of Chabad links the last Lubavitcher Rebbe to his six predecessors. In so doing, Wolfson also makes intelligible the incarnationalism of the radical Chabadniks who hail the last Rebbe as, quote, divinity in physical garb. With this brief overview of relevant 21st century scholarship in mind, let us look specifically at Jewish writings, excuse me, Jewish readings of the Shema. Since that single verse from Deuteronomy plays such an important role in Garber and Hansen's treatment of Messianic Judaism. Everett Fox is in step with much of contemporary Jewish biblical scholarship in seeing the Echad of the Shema as a summons to worship yud heh vav -He alone. This coheres with the Jewish liturgical tradition, which views Israel's recitation of the Shema as taking on the yoke of Malchut Shemai, that is, as acknowledging yud heh vav -He's sovereignty. It also fits the Jewish exegetical tradition of Deuteronomy 6.4, summarized by Rashi in this way. yud heh vav -He, who is our God, Eloheinu, now, but not the God of the nations, is destined to be one God, as it says in Zechariah 14.9, on that day yud heh vav -He shall be one and his name one. Rashi reads the Shema in light of Zechariah 14, which makes yud -Heh vav -Heh's oneness an eschatological hope rather than a timeless metaphysical truth. This amounts to a dynamic relational understanding of Echad in contrast to the eternal ontological view proposed by Garber and Hansen. The Jewish mystical tradition blazes even a more daring path. The Zohar sees the three divine names contained in the Shema, yud heh vav -He, Eloheinu, and then the repetition of yud heh vav -He, as referring to three of the Sefri Rot, 
chesed, gvura, and tiferet. In the liturgical recitation of the Shema, a Jew unifies the three. Similarly, the Zohar understands Yodei Vafe in Zechariah 14.9 as a reference to Tiferet and his name as Shekhinah. The verse thus speaks of the messianic future when Tiferet and Shekhinah are one. The liturgical unification of the Sefi wrote, accomplished in Israel's recitation of the Shema, thus anticipates and facilitates their eschatological unification. The Hasidic stream of Jewish mysticism as exemplified by Chabad reads the Shema less in terms of inner divine differentiation and more in terms of incarnation. As Wolfen st Wolfson states, quote, in Chabad symbolism, Yudhe Vavhe names the essence that is above nature and Elohim its appearance in nature. The conjunction of Yudhe Vavhe and Elohim bespeaks the mystery of incarnation. In professing in the Shema that Yudhe Vavhe is Eloheinu, the worshiper gives verbal assent and thereby participates in the puzzle of incarnation, the commingling of the metaphysical and physical. By proclaiming the oneness of God, worshipers theurgically draw down the disclosure of the light of the infinite that is above the aspect of place so that it will be revealed in the aspect of place and the place will be annihilated. And this is, the Lord is one, end of quote. None of these exegetical and liturgical traditions conform to the absolute monotheism, which Maimonides championed and which Garber and Hansen treat as axiomatic. With that axiom eliminated, the argument of chapter six of Judaism and Jesus lacks cogency. But that is not sufficient in itself to warrant acceptance of Messianic Jewish incarnationalism as a legitimate expression of Jewish faith. While Jewish tradition as a whole does not regard inner divine differentiation and divine incarnation as a priori impossibilities, that tradition has universally denied the contention that God has taken human form in Jesus of Nazareth. Michael Vishagrad describes the situation well, depicting it as a divergence in the stories which Jews and Christians hear from the word of divine revelation. I quote from Vishagrad. If Judaism cannot accept incarnation, that is divine incarnation in Jesus, it is because it does not hear this story because the word of God, as it hears it, does not tell it, and because Jewish faith does not testify to it. And if the church does accept incarnation, it is not because it somehow discovered that such an event had to occur, given the nature of God or of being or reality or anything else, but because it hears that this was God's free and gracious decision, a decision not predictable, by humankind, end of quote. Similar positions have been articulated by Pinchas Lapid and Herschel Matt. Vishagrad, Lapid, and Matt all reject a Maimonidian absolute monotheism, which would rule out Jesus's divine human identity on a priori philosophical or theological grounds. They do hold that an incarnationalist view of Jesus is incompatible with Jewish faith. But they adopt this position as an a posteriori judgment confirmed by the historical witness of the Jewish people. Of course, the witness of the Jewish people before the historical rupture initiated by the enlightenment 
and emancipation, also ruled out deistic and atheistic versions of Judaism. That fact did not prevent forms of Judaism which espouse such views from arising in the past century and attaining widespread acceptance as legitimate expressions of the Jewish religious consciousness. Only Jews who affirm the divine human identity of Jesus are now excluded from the Jewish conversation. Even when we are otherwise living rather traditional Jewish lives and holding rather conventional Jewish theological opinions. Given the attitudes towards Messianic Jews that remain dominant among Jewish leaders, Zev Garber and Kenneth Hansen have shown courage in engaging publicly with the likes of David Rudolph and myself. They have not excluded us from the conversation. We are grateful for the opportunity they have given us to state our case. While Zev and Ken believe that all Jews need to take Brother Jesus seriously, they disagree profoundly with our incarnationalist perspective on our brother. I have here called into question the cogency of their argument. For Jews such as David and myself, taking brother Jesus seriously means encountering in him the unique and unsurpassable revelation of the God of Israel. I am convinced that eventually the Jewish people as a whole will make a place for us among its tents. Acknowledging that Maimonidean absolute monotheism is only one possible reading of the Shema, and seeing that our views of God cohere with those espoused by other Jews through the centuries, they will make room for Jesus, the God-filled apocalyptic prophet and messianic claimant, as well as for his Jewish disciples. Certainly not today, probably not tomorrow, but perhaps the day after tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and those who are listening and those who are on the panel, I am now the fourth presenter and let me suggest what I'll be doing. Whereas my colleagues read papers very academically astute, et cetera, I do what I do best and that is teach a class and teach a lesson. Let me approach the whole issue of what my presentation is, raising the question of why Messianic Judaism as it now is established has a possibility, but for, from my point of view, will not be able to be included as far as organized Judaism is concerned based on one basic principle, and that is the belief in what is traditionally called in Christology, Jesus Christ, Lord God, Savior and Redeemer. The respect that is done by these groups, I have that, but to include that as part of Jewish belief and practice is a very difficult concept and I don't think I can accept it, neither today, tomorrow, or the day after. Having said all of that, why does a person of my caliber get involved with Christology? Is the fascination of the topic or is it possibly a different understanding of how Jesus should be seen and possibly influential now as far as Messianic Jews are concerned. What comes to mind is an invitation by to King's University and my good friend, David Rudolph, who introduced me before a group of Messianic Jews and probably Gentiles for Torah as I'll call them, sitting in an audience where unexpectedly David said, Zev is here to bring us all to do Teshuvah. I never had an introduction of that caliber. To do teshuvah, I presume means to do repentance. But that word teshuvah has a double entendre. It's a double meaning. It also possibly could mean to give us an answer. So in all due respect to Mark and David, let me give you an answer to the positions that you both raised so eloquently and countered by my position. What I choose to do is to write down some of my thoughts. I hope it's, it's visible to, for you to see. 
you're able to see in English transliteration the words Peshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. When one talks about Jesus these days, I hear more than the word Lord and God, even more than the word Messiah, the word Jesus, Rabbi. Rabbi Jesus, Jesus in Judaism, the Jewish Jesus. I also read that the Jewish believers of Jesus in the first century are now called Yeshua, Yeshuaites, and on and on. In fact, in order to in order to confirm that position, I have a book here which I'm currently reading and reviewing for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly called Christology between Judaism and Christianity. It's a German book, all in German, where German Christian scholars, Protestants and Catholics, and a few Jewish contributors as well, are making the point that above all other titles, Jesus is to be seen as rabbi or simply as teacher. If that is so, then let me carry on with my argument. The word Peshat means the simplicity of a text how a text is inherited, how it is transmitted. What all of us don't seem to realize, including scholars in the field, is that the text we call Holy Scriptures, or the text called the Torah, or the text called the Brit HaTashah, is basically handed down in one form, multiple forms, before it becomes the form we use today for worship and for guidance. As far as the Torah of Israel is concerned, the text itself is totally unvocalized, which therefore means a verse such as Hashomer Achi Anochi, which I happened to raise with a group of high school students taking Hebrew at Los Angeles Valley College, whom I'm conducting the class for this summer. The word Hashomer Achi Anochi can be read as Hashomer Achi Anochi, am I my brother's keeper? Cain's response to God's question, where is your brother? And basically, am I my brother's keeper? But if one were to look at the Torah script itself, Hashomer does not have any vocalization. It can well be the definite article, I am my brother's keeper. Or it probably is, as so pointed, the hey Hashela, the hey of the question, am I my brother's keeper? What also is not clear is that the text itself does not spell out the word Shomer the way it's traditionally spelled a shin with a long cholam, a vav, a mem and a resh. The vav is missing. It's shin mem resh. How do I know how to read the word as shomer? It's the vocalization that's superimposed upon the text that gives us the proper reading of reading it as shomer. That is the point of remez. When you see a text which is not clear or can have double or triple meanings, we then begin to get intrigued by it and we then begin to interpret it. And our interpretation reflects more our position, whether it's the first century, medieval period, or post enlightenment period, as demonstrated by presentations done this afternoon, or this evening, depending on which coast time you're listening to this program. My point is, a text is what it is. The original authors are out of the scene. It is then the confrontation by the reader who sees problems into problems, and then interpretations are offered, which is then passed on from generation to generation. That is what is meant by the remez and that third level there, the drash. I do drash, I do midrash, I do interpretation. It is for me what works best. And then hopefully collectively all our midrashim will help us get to the soul, which is the mystery which is the secret itself. I'll get to that with that word Ain Sof, which Mr. Mark brought out as far as mysticism is concerned and the Svirot that help him understand what is meant by the incarnate God. But before we get to any of that, let me give you an example of a Peshat. I read the opening sentence of Genesis, Breshit Bara. The word Breshit itself does not mean in the beginning. The word Breshit itself does not mean the new translation when God began to create. Breshit as Breshit is Breshit means beginning of, and a word is missing. The word is missing. Rashi has been quoted by both David and Mark. Rashi, our great medieval commentary, 
or commentator essentially suggested that the beginning is beginning of wisdom and so does his little interpretation. Breshit is Breshit Chacham or Chachma, quoting a verse that's found somewhere in Proverbs. And that is something we need to orient ourselves to. According to Jewish tradition, there's no before, there's no after. There's neither before nor after, as if to suggest there's no time sequence as far as Torah is concerned. The Torah is also in B'dibur Adam, in the language of man. So when I say God is God is God, or when I say God is Hashem, or when I say God is Elohim, or when I say God is Ein Sof, or when I say God is incarnate, or when I say God is the Son of Man, or when I say God is the Ancient of Days, this is human language to describe inner feelings, beliefs, or practices, and that's as far as it goes. The only definition I can handle is who are you, God? What is your name? Mahashem, eh, yeah, I shall be. Why the eh, yeah? Why not the I am that I am? Because the Hebrew language does not have a present tense. The present tense is called a benoni, the dangling tense. And to my good friends, Mark and David, and Messianic Judaism as a whole, you are the benoni. You are the dangling. There is the avar that is, there's the atid that will be, and in between where you don't get recognized is because you are the benoni. The benoni does not exist in the Hebrew language. There is no present as present as past or as past can be seen as future. That is part of the dilemma which Messianic Judaism needs to deal with and it will deal with it slowly but surely. And let me go further with this. Why the eh, yeah? Why not avar? Why not hayiti? I shall be that I shall be in interpretation. I shall be as Israel shall be. I shall be as the destiny of the Jewish nation shall be. I shall be as Israel does its commandments and does its obedience and does its practices. That is how I shall be known. I will be known by the people Israel. I will be not known by the practices of nations. I will be known by Avodah Kodesh and not by Avodah Zarah. Strange work will not reveal me. God is an El Kana, a jealous God, and not an El Acher, and not another God. Mark quotes the Aleno prayer. A verse that has been purposely deleted is a verse for Haim and they bow down to an ale, lo Yoshia, to a God that doesn't save. A God that, does, that, that is not our God, an existing God, but not the God of Israel. You might say that's exclusive, that's exclusivity. That's exclusive by way of thinking. That's what's probably meant by chosen. Chosen means Kodesh. Kodesh means separation. It does not mean superior or inferior. It means different. And this is where we're now leading you to. When it comes to Judaism, biblically speaking, the Sefer Habrit, the Book of the Covenants, before there is the Torah, as the Torah is the Torah, before there is the Luchot Habrit, the covenants of the covenant, the tablets, tables of the covenant, there is a Sefer Brit associated with Naaseh and Nishma. God speaks to Moses and the people respond Naaseh. God, Moses writes down those words, the Sefer Brit, and the people then add Naseh and Nishma, Exodus chapter 24. I look at David in particular and Mark, whom I know a little less than David, and David in appearance, and David in habit, and David in Kashrut, and David in his home, and David in his table, and his wonderful, beautiful family is no different than a Zev Garber. We all look the same orthodox. I have an Israeli kippah, he has a Hasidic kippah, but that's the difference. But the appearance is so Jewish. And that is what's deceiving to people who say to me and to Ken, why are you engaged in dialogue with them? They're deceptive. Meaning what? The Naaseh is what Messianic Judaism does. We are traditional Jews, thank you. So why don't we have a place at the table recognized by all. 
It's because of the second word, anishma. How do you understand your na'aseh? How do you interpret it? How do you rationalize it? And for the Messianic Jew, it's one word and strictly one word, Jesus and the lifetime and the promises and the conceptions dealing with the Messiah of Israel. That's the difference, outwardly very Jewish. Motivatedly, it's done with a different principle. Reverse that order. On Friday, I'm gonna give a talk on either side before a large audience on hint of dialogue. The Catholic Church quotes me on my questioning about her Jewishness. And I've been told more than once in the advisory of how to teach either side that Zev Garman needs to learn a lesson. She's Jewish, she felt Jewish. She died in the Holocaust. She was one of the victims. I know all that. The outward appearance means nothing. It's her inner soul, which is Jewish, which is what they want to recognize. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. What you need to have is both a na'aseh, and as you do the na'aseh, you then give the interpretation. It's not because I believe, that's why I do. It's because I do, that's why I believe. And now let me bring you to the Shema itself. The Shema has been used and focused by Mark as well as by David a number of times. I have the Shema in front of me, and I'm afraid my reading of it, which Mark refers to as absolute monotheism, and puts me in the line of the Rambam of Maimonides himself. If that's how I'm looked at, then let it be that way, but I think the terminology is terribly important. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where you have Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I have the verse in front of me, and the word Shema has a capital ayin, if you're really able to read Hebrew. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, Shema Israel, Hashem Lokeno, Hashem Echad. The word Echad one has a exaggerated dalit at the end. The word Shema has an exaggerated, the word Shema has exaggerated ayin. Why exactly are there exaggerated letters in the scriptural writing of this verse? I don't know. I don't know, except that's how it's handed down. And once something stands out, Yotzeh Menachah is unusual, interpretation is required. The interpretation I like is that of rabbinic Judaism. And if Jesus is gonna be referred to as Rabbi Jesus, particularly the school of Hillel, then Rav Jesus will have no problem with understanding that the Ayn and Dalit is meant to me a testimony, to bear testimony, to be a witness, a witness to what? To the Shema, to be such a witness both at the morning and evening, at birth and at death, to be able to say the Shema is said to be the last words a Jew is required to say before he expires and keep that in mind. I also have a sense that the word Shema has to be emphasized because of how Hebrew is pronounced. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people say Shema Yisrael. Shema means perhaps, O Israel, the Lord our God is not of one God. So you've got to be very careful. Shema, listen carefully, listen carefully. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hashem you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. The nefesh is your life animating principle. And what's translated as might in my translation here, the word ma'od means with all your veriness. And basically a doctrine of fundamental dogma, monotheism, of duty, which is love, and discipline, which is study. The reference of Lord our God and God is one, I guess can be seen by some to be a plurality. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem. Three times implies a triunity and that is seen by some to see the hero, hero Israel to be a triunity belief and not an absolute monotheistic belief. But let me go fast forward right now as time is marching on. I see the crucifixion to be that which for me personally reveals the Jewish Jesus. The agony at the cross. No one at this panel has made for reference to that at all. Well, why not? 
the last moments so recorded by Jesus of Nazareth is that rare phrase associated with his mouth in agonizing cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. The reference to the deity is not Hashem, which basically would imply mercy. It's not the word Elohi or Elohai, meaning the concept of justice. It's El, El, a borrowed word, I might add, a borrowed word, I might add, a borrowed word, I might add, in biblical Judaism. And consequently, who was this El? El was the supreme God, the El Elyon, the one that was, you know, was celebrated grandson was Baal. And both those terms have been brought into Judaism by depaganizing it and become part of synonymous terms for God himself. But Jesus at the cross asks, why do you forsake me? Why that question? Is because Jesus did not fulfill his mission? Let's use the term Messiah of Israel. Is it because he failed because he couldn't accomplish everything? Is it because he's a failed Messiah? Or is it because God came forth with judgment on Jesus, suggesting you are too much being respected? In fact, you're being replacing me as far as God as God is God. Did God permit the death of Jesus by the Romans in order for God to be liberated? Is this what we call Jesuolatry that some scholars refer to? And God to be God had to have the death of Jesus. I'm not interested in any of these academics. I asked myself, Jesus, why did you not say the Shema? Could you not say the Shema at the cross? Could you not say, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one? Why is that lacking? I'll give you two answers. It's lacking because Jesus could not and would not accept death because to say the Shema is entrance into death. Or maybe it's because millions of Jews in subsequent history were put in a similar Kiddush Hashem, martyrdom in the sake of God's name, and did not have the ability to say the Shema. As they expelled them, as they crucified them, as they burnt, burnt them, as they gassed them in the show. Is that what that symbol is? That Jesus identifies with the Jews who agonizingly ask God, where are you? I have in mind a picture of Elie Wiesel in his book, Night, where he has three Jews hanging in a type of noose and asks screamingly, where is God? And Wiesel saying, the Abishta is due. Where is the Almighty? The Almighty is dangling. He's dangling. He's dangling in the noose. As if to suggest that God, the second of the three people, is this what Wiesel is talking about? Jesus in the noose? Or is this basically a perennial question of Jews when death and destruction take place? I do a midrash now, and I have my Jesus turn around. From the Inri, he now looks at the churches that worship in his name. You, David, made nice reference to that, saying that Zeb Garber suggests the following, we who pray in the faith of Jesus and those who pray to Jesus by faith. Yeah, you're right about that. Jesus is part of the minion. And Jesus, the agonizing Jesus, will now turn to Christians who worship in his name and he will ask them a basic question. What have you done in my name? What have you done to my people? What have you done to my Jewish people? You have profaned my name. You have decimated my nations. That is the Jesus that Zev Garba teaches. And the mission of Messianic Jews is to talk to Gentiles and to somehow understand that mission with them. Supersessionism, thank goodness, is now put on hold. The mission of Messianic Jews is now continuing. So my good friend, Mark, when are you gonna come back, so to speak? I guess it is the following. Permit me with a few more minutes. I have another word here. I have the word tzitzit. I have the word tzitzit. The word for the fringe garment. It's right over here, right over here. If you take a look at Numbers chapter 15, 
you have the famous verse that says, Uritem uschartem viasitem. You are to look at the fringes, you are to remember, and you are to do. You are to look at the fringes, you are to remember, and you are to do. This is what I wear every morning, 365 days, every day when I begin my prayers. I will have my talit, my tzitzit on. What is fascinating to use now mysticism is the gematria. If one takes the word tzitzit, sadi yud, sadi yud tav, as everybody spells that word today, then you have the following numerical value. The sadi is 90, the yud is 10, the sadi is 90, the yud is 10, and the last letter tav is 400. Add them together, you get 600. And with 600, you then have a one, two, three, four, five knots and eight strings. So from this tassel, the tassel that Jesus wore, the tassel garment, you have the number 13. 13 with 600, 613, and that's your commandment system. And yet a closer read of the Peshat does not have the word Sitzit with two Yuds, only one Yud. Sadi yud, sadi tav. Ten is missing. If that's so, then it's only 603. There's a missing ten. And my good friend David and Mark, listen very carefully. The number ten is the yud. The yud is the yid. The yid is the pentala. Your book, David, has a floating Jesus wearing the fringe garment, and in the background is a burning shtetl. Shagal's floating Jesus. Zev Garber, Zev Garber has his Jesus. My Jesus is not floating, my Jesus is living. My Jesus is reading a Torah. My Jesus is not over some kind of burning shtetl in Eastern Europe. And the title of this volume on Jesus is Revelation, Reflection, and Reclamation. So my Messianics, you're not alone. Ken and I are reclaiming Jesus as well. You are the floating Jesus. You are the Yud that has not yet come home. I have no doubts in my mind that one day, David and Mark, you'll be sitting at the table and Jesus would just simply be a partner. He would not be the source. He would not be the cause. He would just be another Jew among Jews. Ain't so how beautiful are those words. God is limitless. Reverse the order. Sof ain. When all is said and done, ain nothing. What are you saying? I'm saying what I'm saying. Now listen to the interpretation. Nothing means not thingness. Doesn't mean non existence. And when I wake up in the morning, I say mode ani. I don't say ani mode. When I go to sleep at night, I say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. I enter into a deep sleep. On a personal note, two weeks ago, I went under a knife. They changed the battery in my pacemaker. They did not put me to sleep. I felt the puncture. Under a blanket, I wanted to say the Shema. I couldn't say it. I thought it. I didn't complete it. What if I did complete it? That would have been my entrance out of this world. They removed the blanket and the brightness of the light blinded me. 
I went through to Chiat Amitim. Jesus could not say the Shema. Jesus did not want to die. That's the issue. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you learned something new, please consider liking and subscribing to receive updates for more content like this. Please let us know where you agree, disagree, or share any questions you have in the comments below. Or you can send us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's T-W-O messianicjews at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and see you next time.